All right, everybody, this English major is gonna drop some science. So this video is another Couch to Kanza update. Uh, a lot of people had lots of comments and questions about our training, uh, especially this whole fat adaptation thing. So I thought I would kind of dig a little bit deeper into why we're training the way we are. And again, before I jump in, I do want to give a disclaimer. Um, you know, I am not super well versed in this stuff. I'm learning it as I go along with the help of a coach. So this is my attempt to kind of explain uh, the science behind some of the training that we're doing in plain English, partly because uh, you guys are interested, but also because I feel like if I can articulate it, then that means I can understand it and wrap my brain around it and embrace the training. So before I get started, I do want to give a huge thanks and shout out to one of our readers, Mike J, who sent over some reading material all about uh, low carb performance. Um, he saw our last video, really took it to heart and uh, just totally surprised us with some surprise mail, uh, good resources for this kind of training methodology. So before I go into the weeds, I feel like I have to talk a little bit about Dirty Kanza and kind of what we expect our performance to be because that's really going to dictate um, how we're training. DK is a 200 mile gravel event, so it is largely an endurance event. So realistically, I think we're going to be on the bike um, you know, somewhere between 15 to 18 hours. So we're not competing for the podium. We're not going to be in a position where we're going to have to jump in a breakaway and we're not going to compete a field sprint. I think our primary objective is to finish, to be resilient, to cross that finish line and not collapse immediately afterwards, or at least until we have beer. So with that said, that means primarily our training is going to focus on uh, endurance, on being able to, to churn out low to medium efforts for long periods of time. We're never gonna have to really hit peak power because we're not gonna be, you know, out sprinting someone. For us, it's gonna be a war of attrition. Basically, the course versus our bodies. Not so much us versus some other rider. So that's basically why we're training the way we are with a big focus on uh, aerobic base, long kind of aerobic mileage, and not so much high intensity training. We're not trying to increase our peak power, our 20 second power. We're just trying to build a huge aerobic engine so we can just power through for you know, 15, 18 hours. And I know some of you are gonna chime in right away and say, well, you can do intervals and kind of accelerate that method. And yes, there is a school of thought that believes that, but that's just not what we're gonna do uh, for ourselves personally. So I'm not saying that's wrong or that we're right or I'm just saying that's not what we're doing this time around. Maybe for another event, we might try that out. But for this one, we're just gonna focus on uh, enduring. So please don't get your feelings hurt that we're not doing you know, high intensity training and carbo loading, okay? It's not you, it's us. So given the parameters that we have to work with, what are we doing? I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the science because that's gonna dictate uh, our training plan. So in the previous video, I mentioned that uh, we get our energy from essentially two sources, glucose, and fat. There are two pathways to access this energy. One is through glycolysis that accesses energy from the glucose, the sugar through a fermentation process. And that's generally pretty quick, easy to access. And what you access when uh, you, you do higher intensities or if you eat a lot of carbs and sugary drinks on your rides. So that works for a lot of people. You know, there is a whole uh, sports nutrition industry built around that kind of thinking. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it. we've tried that, but we're going to try something else this time around. So if you're not burning glycogen or sugar, where else can you get your energy? And that's where your fat stores come into play. Like I said in the previous video, you know, you can carry probably about 1500 to 2000 calories of sugar at any given time, but your fat stores are almost unlimited. I think about 30 to 40,000 calories is, is a number I usually see in my lay study. But the thing about fat stores is it's really hard to kind of derive energy um, from those stores. Your body kind of has to mine it out and do this whole processes that tend to be slower to convert that fat into ATP, which ultimately gives us energy. And it gets problematic because if you eat a lot of carbs, um, you know, get most of your energy from sugar, then that's the first place your body's gonna look for for energy. So there really is a forceful kind of retraining of the body to access the fat stores. And there's lots of reasons why you wanna do this. You know, again, there's a lot of potential energy, but 
it'll also prevent you from bonking. Yes, your brain uses generally glycogen to keep brain function. So when you bonk, it's because of lack of glycogen, but you can train your body and your brain to access energy from fat so you don't get the bonk. So in the previous video, I talked about uh, how you can do that via dietary ma manipulation. So cutting out carbs, um, you know, doing some fasted rides. So you're just consuming plain water in efforts under three hours. So just to be clear, we're not going full keto here. It's kind of a real popular buzzword. And uh, I don't think we're gonna go that super strict. We're more of the type of people to do things in moderation and not to go to extremes. So we are gonna apply some of that thinking, definitely uh, restrict more carbs, but within reason for us. So another way to be a more uh, fat adapted athlete, rather than being in a, a state of ketosis, is to build up your aerobic pathway. So here comes some science from an English major. So as you know, when you exercise or go biking or running, um, if you go at low intensities, you go at an aerobic pace. You're burning mostly fat, some glycogen. And then as that effort increases, you start to burn more glycogen and less fat until you hit a certain point when you're doing super high intensity, when your fat really drops off and your glycogen usage really spikes. So it's kind of this curve that goes flat and then uh, spikes upwards. The interesting thing is depending on how you train, you can kind of change the shape of that graph. So I'm gonna look at two kind of extreme examples. One, let's look at a graph of like a super sedentary person just sits on the couch. You know, they may be in fat burning mode when they're sitting on the couch, but the second they get up uh, with little effort, they go straight into glycolysis and go anaerobic, start burning sugars immediately. On the extreme end, let's look at a graph of a super fat adapted endurance athlete. Again, I'm showing you two extremes just so you can see where we're gonna try to land in the middle. For them, the graph looks completely different. They stay in the aerobic zone for longer at higher intensities than the other person, but eventually they will start to produce lactate, start to ferment their sugars and go anaerobic. But the speed at which uh, they stay aerobic increases, you can train that speed. So that in a nutshell is what we're trying to do. We're trying to stay aerobic as long as possible and try to, and try to increase the speeds at which we are aerobic. So hypothetically speaking, let's say um, you know a couple weeks ago, once we hit that 11 mile per hour mark, that was our aerobic threshold and start burning sugars. Ideally with the training and the dietary manipulation that we're doing, we can push that from 10 to the upper teens, ideally. So that means we're essentially gonna be running at an aerobic uh, intensity, but with a higher pace. Does that make sense? As long as we stay in the aerobic zone, we're gonna be burning predominantly fat and should be able to last longer with less sugars. And it's not gonna be sexy, you know, it's gonna be kind of a fairly slow uh, pace compared to the front end of the field. Again, we're not sprinting, we're not making breakaways. That's not gonna be the reality of our dirty Kanza. Our reality is to endure, stay within ourselves, and be resilient. So in terms of how we're gonna try to accomplish this goal, it's gonna be through uh, a lot of long sessions at an aerobic pace. And the reason you wanna do this is because more science, uh, you basically increase the uh, mitochondrial density in your cells. So essentially the more mitochondria that you have, the more fat you can burn efficiently. So in essence, we're just trying to grow that mitochondrial density and that will allow us to stay aerobic longer before we start having to tap into the sugar. And we're gonna do that by doing lots of long rides you know, staying aerobic and not peaking, not trying to go anaerobic. And this is where things get kind of controversial. There's lots of different schools of thought. Um, you know, there's the uh, high intensity school of thought where it says you can do this by performing above threshold and kind of lifting everything up. And there's the other school of thought that says the best way to train the aerobic system is to train aerobically and, and push it up from the bottom. So while it's sexier a lot, more immediately because you see your power go up and all these other metrics. The downside of course is, um, you know, training volume. In order to, to have these po positive adaptations in the aerobic pathway, uh, there are no <laughs> shortcuts. There's no 90 minute uh, high intensity session, at least in the, the school of thought that we're prescribing to for this particular event. Again, don't get your feelings hurt. The only way to do it is to ride those long, slow-ish, 
miles. That was some science. I know it's gonna be controversial. There's gonna be lots of you that are gonna be like carb, 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 high intensity, intervals, all these things. And that's cool. You know, do, do what works for you. But this is the approach that we're taking uh, this particular time around for this particular event. If you're gonna leave a comment, be nice, don't be a dick. If you guys have any other specific questions, leave those in the comments below. Uh, I'm gonna link to some books uh, and some resources that we're reading that are kind of guiding this whole philosophy. So if you wanna see those, check out the description. And until next time, ride bikes, travel, and do good.